Hi there. Today we're going to look at a book written by one of the uh, enlisted men or um, NCOs in the SEALs. Um, previously, we've had two books written by officers, and it's this book, One Perfect Op, by Command Master Chief Dennis Choker, <coughs> excuse me, who uh, was a member of the SEAL Team 6. <coughs> so he first actually, um, and the book, by the way, has a, an introduction by uh, Richard Marcinko. <coughs> he first joined the Army, uh, 82nd Airborne, and uh, went through jump school and did his, his full um, a term of service there describes it in detail and then after a short pause he was looking for something different really and he joined the navy specifically to become a seal uh, he has to go through the basic training which is how to um, make your bed etc um, but uh, then is told he's, he's going to have to go uh, on a ship but he, he, he's made a good contact um, of a guy's put him through some pre-training who manages to pull strings and he gets sent to Buds and he's in class 101, which is a winter class. So he, he, he describes um, really what Buds is all about. And when he um, went through it, there wasn't really a lot known about it. There wasn't a lot of information out there. Nowadays, um, Guys can have a, almost a, an hour by, uh, by hour or day by day guide to what buds entails. Um, but the, the pass rate remains the same. So it doesn't really matter how much free information you have to mentally prepare, etc. It's very, very difficult to physically prepare for buds. You can run, you can swim, etc. But that's not what makes the six month um, program so arduous. There's lots of little things. And one of them is, and I'll, I'll quote from the book, any mistakes caused you to get cold, wet and sandy again. Rolling in the sand when you were wet, all, wet all over created the sugar cookie effect, a favorite amongst buds instructors. The sugar cookie effect is hard to describe. And harder to forget. Imagine a cookie in a jar, all covered with sugar. As it settles into the jar, it rubs against the sugar from other cookies until it starts to pick up that sugar too. Soon the cookie is covered all over, even in spots where sugar shouldn't be. Now imagine the same situation, only the cookie is your skin and the sugar is nice abrasive sand. The top layer of your skin soon disappears and then there's the soft, tender, sensitive new layer all ready for a good sandy rubbing. Believe me, it's a bitch to patch a rubber bow when you've become a sugar cookie. When the sand gets into your ears, knocking it out won't work, and it doesn't feel very good. It doesn't taste good grinding between your teeth or smell good as it clogs up your nose. The eyes more or less wash themselves out, but the irritation is still there. It's because of the sugar cookie effect that most frogmen and seals hold a lifelong aversion to wearing underwear. So he passes, <coughs> graduates through uh, buds and is assigned to SEAL Team 1, which was the West Coast team. And uh, he describes what life was like back then. A lot of the instructors were former Vietnam vets and so on. And uh, they did uh, training evolutions to the Philippines, um, Korea, place like that. And um, he was originally in Kilo Platoon, but then after a couple of deployments was sent to Echo Platoon. And Echo Platoon <clears throat> was different. It had a counterterrorism role. Uh, it was studying and training maritime counterterrorism. And um, it was the West Coast uh, equivalent of Mob 6 
Mobility 6, which was a platoon in SEAL Team 2, which was doing the same thing, and actually doing a lot of work with SPS. So, uh, working in um, Echo Platoon, um, they get a visit from um, Dick Marcinko, and um, <clears throat> he's standing up a new unit, and uh, so he holds um, interviews and Denny Chalker is earmarked to go to the new unit, which is SEAL Team 6, out on the East Coast. So he moves across country, joins SEAL Team 6. Um, and at the time, it had two assault groups. One, which was on an alert status, ready to deploy, so was confined to doing training in the local area. And then the other assault group, which was on the reserve status, could um, wander further afield to do diving trips and uh, sniper training at different uh, venues and so on. Um, one, one of the things they do, <coughs> excuse me, is a, a, an underway takedown of, of a ship um, to demonstrate how they can recover a ship that's been hijacked and um, they come aboard and there's a, they're being observed by an admiral and uh, they line up to meet the admiral after the exercise and he asks them, are, are you are you guys in the Navy? Because they've got long hair, beards and so on, what they call relaxed grooming standards. Um, so he, uh, De Denny Joker is, is sent out to Australia to work with the Australian SAS. Um, and he gets involved in uh, <clears throat> aircraft hijack recovery training, sniper training, and so on, uh, exchanging ideas out there. Then uh, SEAL Team 6 moves to a new facility at Dam Neck, and <clears throat> they start doing things like um, oil platform takedowns, training, and things like that. Uh, they formed a third assault team, Red Team, and uh, Denny moves over to that uh, to stand that up uh, because um, they um, were allotted more uh, resources, uh, manpower and equipment when they moved to Danla. So uh, he's involved in the Grenada operation, talks about that in great detail. And um, then uh, he joins Red Cell, which is the unit set up by Marcinko after he left uh, SEAL Team 6, which was to test uh, the security of uh, naval installations. And they do uh, penetration tests on things like the submarine pen base, um, bases out on the West Coast and so on, and cause a certain amount of havoc upset an awful lot of people by showing their deficiencies and so on and so uh, after, after they returns to uh, seal team six <clears throat> and uh, the, the book actually starts with this operation that's the title of the book one perfect dot they have a task to go and recover uh, an important family from haiti which is in the throes of um, a massive disorder at the time so they come in from the sea and they've got to extract the family, uh, an American family, uh, and, and take them uh, back by boat uh, to a ship and then back to the United States. And Denny's particular uh, task is to uh, take care of the baby. So he has to think about this and he uh, gets a baby carrier one of those that um, the mothers usually have the baby clipped into and he spray paints it black and he even ties uh, what we call a dummy what they might call a pacifier to it with a piece of paracord to the baby and um, it's a successful operation but what he didn't know at the time was SEAL Team 6 was being looked at very very closely with a view to maybe um, winding it up and this was a make or break operation had they failed uh, the fate of seal team six would likely have been terminated
<coughs> so the end of it, <coughs> excuse me, the end of his naval career, he uh, goes back to Buds and, and runs uh, the training there from the um, the petty officer side. He, he's uh, the, the senior petty officer there at Buds. And there's a couple of funny stories he tells. At the time, they had this system where, because they were losing so many guys, somebody had the bright idea that instead of the guys just ringing the bell and, and they were gone, they had to first um, be counselled. And it went up uh, a chain of command. And, and the final counsellor was Denny, or the, the senior chief. And if the guy wanted to leave, then they sent him to ring the bell. Anyway, Denny's sitting there at his desk drinking a coffee, and they wheel in this guy. And uh, Denny says to him, um, "Okay, well, you know, why do you want to leave?" And uh, the guy says, "Well, I'm not really a morning person." And uh, Denny splutters out his coffee, of course. Uh, the other interesting story from Buds, and I'll just get it, is they used to have a presidential visit. Uh, during a president's term, he would visit Coronado and um, visit the uh, training. So, um, for example, when President Reagan went, um, the, the thing was to, to run with the guys. And when it was President Reagan, they had to draw lots because everybody wanted to run with him. And they drew lots and some guys won and they had the honor of running with the president. Then it was President Clinton, and the order came, right, you've got to, you've got to furnish um, two SEAL volunteers. Nobody volunteers. So they start making incentives, saying, oh, you know, get a day off and so on. Nobody volunteers. Nobody wants to run with Clinton. And in, in the end, they had to threaten them. They had to... Um, I'll just see what. Look, I told the two instructors, one sitting in front of me, you two messed up. I'm going to give you a choice. You can run with the president or you can come in Friday and Saturday this weekend and Friday and Saturday next weekend and have the duty. So very reluctantly, they agree to run with the president rather than have two weekends um, where they have to work. And that just shows you um, who Clinton was and how he was regarded by the US military. So Denny Choker's book is, is terrific. Um, it's a real insight from the point of view of an operator uh, going through all that. He, he, he was obviously highly respected, had a, a terrific career. Uh, I, I've skipped over uh, the details. It, the interest of a book is obviously in the detail. And he tells all the stories, lots of characters, and um, goes into the training and the operations they did uh, very, very, uh, very, very thoroughly. And it's a totally engrossing read.